shit, I'm unload. Let's get the van and get the fuck out. Donald Trump continues to make an impact without any clothes on. The activist group In Decline arranged for Donald Trump statues to appear yesterday morning, not only here, but also in L.A., New York, Seattle, and Cleveland. Oh, here's a caption from Bill Clinton and Melania Trump. What I see every morning when I wake up. <laughs> Melania Trump was a picture of the naked Donald Trump statue. Wow. I was in my neighborhood walking down Hollywood Boulevard, and there's, like, a giant naked Trump with his tiny little nubbin of a penis. I ran into it by total happenstance and uh, on Castro and Market. It was really funny and effective. It gets people talking about Trump and his narcissism, his insecurity. Instead of being horrified by this orange Tito monster, they're like, they can laugh at him. The Emperor Has No Balls was crucial because we were sounding the alarm well before he was even nominated. In addition to creating something poignant and inspiring, we felt it was also necessary to raise the bar in the event that he was elected. Grab him by the pussy. <laughs> I can do anything. Donald J. Trump is now president of the United States. We are going to make America so great again. <laughs> When Trump won this election, I, I didn't know what to do. I couldn't watch the news. We've ended the war on beautiful, clean coal. North Korea best not make any more threats to the United States. This is my honor. Your organization's terrible. Let's go. Right now is a confusing fucking time in the world. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. This demagogue has, like, gotten control of us. I hate to tell you, Puerto Rico, but you've thrown our budget a little out of whack. I don't know what I Trump, said. I think, sparked the rise of division, racism, sexism, xenophobia. Car just plowed through hundreds of people. Yes, I think there's blame on both sides. We've never had racism come out of the cave like it has under his administration. People die crossing that wall. Maybe they'll just stay on their side. It's a witch hunt. You are fake news. The ambulances are coming and going. It comes from China. One people, one nation, and immigration. Proud well, boys, stand back and stand by. The political crisis, which has always been ongoing, but it seems to be more of a crisis now than anything I've ever beheld in my life. <laughs> Any time you have fascism rear its ugly face, there will always be a greater hunger for resistance art. The time is ripe for people to be fighting that shit. The cultural climate right now is fantastic for resistance art. Art is not a mirror, but a helmet with which you shape the world. My weapon is my paintbrush. That's how I fight. Art could really disrupt mainstream narratives. I honestly can say that the arts have saved my life. It's something that will change the world. I see it as a voice for the voiceless. The early 80s, when I first saw the Robbie Canal, President Reagan contradiction posters all over Los Angeles. I was a kid, you know, and I asked my mom, I was like, 
it, that's the president and they're saying something bad about the president? And she's like, yeah. And I go, can you do that? She's like, yeah, it's a free country. You can say anything you want. And right then it clicked. When I realized that art could be an effective tool for bringing about change in the world was when I was on death row. People started doing things like screen printing Free the West Memphis Three t-shirts. People would hold art shows to pay for attorneys and private investigators and DNA testing, all that sort of stuff. Art really was a very vital component that led to me eventually being released from death row. The power of art is it tells the truth that you won't get from a bureaucrat or a politician. So it exposes that and reflects that. While I was in the Black Panther Party, you had a whole grassroots community that wasn't a reading community, but learned through observation and participation. So if they seen the graphics and the visuals, they could get the gist of the story. You had people who saw in the images, maybe their uncles, their fathers, or their brothers. So now they become the heroes in the artwork themselves. The uh, Black Panther Party, the African-American community, became a national and an international icon that transcended boundaries. With every movement, there's been a movement of art that goes with it that's been made by the people to kind of like stand up and fight against what it is, whatever it is they're fighting against. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense calls upon the American people in general to take careful note. Racist police agencies throughout the country are intensifying the terror, brutality, murder, and repression of black people. Any progressive, radical, or revolutionary change, it's come from below. The people who made the Berlin Wall fall, the people who destroyed apartheid, the people who dismantled Jim Crow had no more intelligence, power, money, courage, or creativity than anyone watching this right now. They stood up in their place and time for a more just and decent household, workplace, school, country, world, and just did it. A lot of people feel like spectators in, in the world, that they've been told that they need to sit on the sidelines while other people shape things. You know, I believe that the more people contributing their voice in a creative way, the better the world will be. Younger generations often feel jaded by politics and they think that there's no hope, there's no room for them. In utilizing urban art, Shepard was really able to activate a younger generation of voters. His artwork became like a huge part of American politics, uh, part of history now. I use what I call the inside-outside strategy. I'll do illegal stuff, but when I get the opportunity to put something that expresses my point of view on a big building legally, even if the person who's building it is doesn't understand the potential antagonism, once it's there, it's creating a conversation. When you do something intelligent that makes people go, shit, that's super effective. Look at what Banksy's done. I mean, it's unbelievable how he's actually got his name out there like that. I mean, I think he's fucking genius. You know, my favorite is Banksy because he's witty, and he's interesting and he works in so many different, you know, levels. Man, he did one uh, at the Gaza Strip. The hole in the wall and it's like paradise on the other side. That was kind of crazy to me. I was like amazed by the message. Like I said so many things without one word being said. Resistance art gets people to think about the things they don't want to think about. We all can live in our own sort of curated realities, but these things that exist in public space 
force people to have more of a community conversation. I'm always doing it, and uh, of course, In Decline has been a major force. We received a message from the activist art group In Decline this morning. The billboard is supposed to say shoot a 50 caliber, but now it says shoot a school kid. Intervening in billboards around guns, I think, is pretty provocative. You know, I admire the, the ambition and the courage. Two billboards, each with a mannequin and a noose around its neck. That's some pretty bold statement. That's, that's some ballsy shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? In decline is pretty militaristic in the way it puts everything together. We have to be. If you've been around 20 years and virtually every single time you go outside to create something as a crime. And we're going to develop a pretty immense rap sheet. Most of the risks involved are legal risks, which are plenty and they're real. You know, I've been to jail for, for art and graffiti, and it's not stopping me. The group In Decline is a group of sick individuals who hate Trump and his supporters and think it's funny to degrade us and then excuse it by calling it art. We don't take ourselves too seriously, obviously, and that's super important. You good? But we also know what, uh, we also know where we stand. I think artists have a combination of jobs to do. Number one, whatever's wrong in the world, if you have a voice, you should certainly be furthering that conversation. Once Trump came in office, I think that really spurred us into action. We knew this guy was gonna assume that he was above the law. So we wanna pull the rope in the opposite direction for these four years and kinda of join people and be on the right side of history. March of 2018, we booked a room at the Trump Hotel in New York City. The Trump Hotel staff came out and graciously took all of our bags up to our room for us. What they didn't know was in those bags were all of our materials, including about 12 live rats. We uh, stripped the entire hotel down to the bones. And once the room is completely empty, we constructed a jail cell and then put a Trump impersonator in the jail cell and surrounded him with live rats and McDonald's wrappers. The Trump in the hotel room with the cape. Yo, that blew my head off. Only thing I could think the whole time I was watching was, what is he gonna think when he sees this? In the client is doing some of the most extravagant takeovers anybody's ever seen. installation work, the crew, the planning, the amount of people, and the amount of people that get reached. There's no way to not have a reaction. I think the more successful Indecline is, the more enemies Indecline has. I was reluctant about doing this interview. That's why I'm masked up, because I know they're gonna be watching this. Respect for Indecline. For doing shit you're not supposed to, shit you could get in a lot of trouble for, but that's the chance you take for art and for being, you know, an activist. You have to be willing to take shit, because you will take shit, you know. If you're taking a polarizing position, you're going to take shit. Nikola Konnikova was sentenced to two years in prison on charges of hooliganism after taking part in the Pussy Riot punk protest staged in Moscow's main cathedral. We got locked inside prison for two years. We were told by the government, you have to admit that you're guilty and you have to bring deep condolences to Putin for being harmed by you and be like, 
hey, I actually love Vladimir Putin, and then you will be let go. We said, no, we don't really see ourselves in this, um, in this light, <laughs> and we stayed in jail. And we were prepared to die for what we believe in. Pussy riot in Russia that sticks in your fucking head. It embarrasses Putin because he could not control them. And it gets to America, the people connect to them. Pussy Riot was like the one thing that I saw growing up in like a suburban town. If they can make music subjecting government, then I can do something in my town. Sunrise has used their logo and their color, the, the color yellow, which is so bright, and they've flooded offices of Nancy Pelosi and it's a sea of yellow. Our party needs to work for us, not for the 1%. It's impossible to change the man's game by playing by their rules. So we have to go outside of those limits. This is about solidarity, and this is about the fact that we are going to make a better future for our kids, and that's what this is about. Breaking the law is a reminder to young people that the laws have to change. Like, why are we supposed to be following laws when corporations are destroying our planet? I mean, you look at Star Wars, it's about a rebel alliance, you know? They're, the rebel alliance is fighting against the Dark Lords, and I, we have that situation right now. There are actually people hell-bent on destroying the planet. Putin and Trump, they are everything that we hate. Not the crap out of them, would you? They're both misogynists. And I love the women. They both don't give a flying fuck about environmental issues, so we have to fight back. Now's the best time in the world to, to fuck shit up, and I mean that in the best way possible. I mean it with love, in the old punk rock fashion of fucking shit up, which is really fixing things. In the good old days, this doesn't happen because they used to treat them very, very rough. And when they protested once, they would not do it again so easily. Beautiful lesson that I've learned with Sunrise is like how to use my voice, and turns out you need a scream. First of all, just doing anything you're not supposed to do is fun. You don't do stuff that hurts people, but you do stuff that fucks with people. If you're not having fun when you're living your life and, and fighting the man, they win. Get angry, get pissed, make change. I would encourage people to break rules that don't make sense because it teaches us a lot about why rules exist in the first place. And it helps us to change rules that aren't working. And you know what, the audience won't. And it really is by any means necessary. You do what it takes. The pessoal jogando bola com a minha cabeça aí. Oh, fuck, did that feel good? We want something that's going to be able to save a human being no matter what Mother Nature throws at him. This is the Halliburton Survivor Ball. The activism and the mischief kind of came up together although I didn't realize there was an activism component at first. Today, the country's largest business lobby, the Chamber of Commerce, got punked. It will reverse its position on the climate change bill and once a carbon tax, if you will. If we are impersonating someone in power, we will try to announce a utopian vision that's like what everybody wants to hear them say, but they otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't be likely to say. Clean coal is a technology that has 
not only not been proven, it basically doesn't exist. Okay, this is, uh, I'm Eric Wolfschlegel, I'm with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Um, this is not an official U.S. Chamber of Commerce event. Can but I see your business card? Can I see yours? Are you here representing the U.S. Chamber of Commerce? Yes, I am. Okay, well I work there and you do not look familiar to me at all. Could I see your business card? Sounds? If we wanted to, as just regular citizens, have a voice in democracy, culture jamming is sort of a way to weasel in and say something louder than you're usually allowed to. This guy is a fraud, he's lying. Let's call it a prank, you know. <laughs> Lighten up, have a sense of humor. You know, I try to practice things to say before the judge. <laughs> I quit thinking about, by any means necessary, being like something violent. I literally feel like that's like a creative call. Oh, oh, hey. well, I've always thought that a flan was the best thing to destroy their uh, sense of dignity. It's good to surround yourself with troublemakers. People that were just natural rule breakers did something visceral. Get in trouble! Trouble. Like say Lenny Bruce. And then it won't matter, even Randy, if you're colored and I'm Jewish. <laughs> he was a humorist, but it was to show that society is sick. Hunter's pure gonzo, huh? He was the guy I had to meet. When I started in my political career, drawing career, I wanted to change the world. And 50 years later, I've achieved it. It's now worse than it was when I started. <laughs> I'd like to punch him in the face, I'll tell you. Shit's fucked up, and we have a responsibility as artists. If, if your superpower is singing a song that people will resonate with, or you're good at drawing on a wall, we all have a responsibility to make beauty out of out of nothing. There's never been a successful social movement that hasn't had a great soundtrack. Black Flag, The Sex Pistols, The Clash. I mean, I was nine years old when I heard Fuck the Police. I'm not interested in just being an ally. I want to be an accomplice. Raise the middle fingers in the sky! A minor threat, the black flag did something different and it started happening globally. Punk is not a movement, it is a culture. It is a rebel culture. The resistance musicians, the artists who are rebellious, they're not making music in order to sell music. They're making music to inspire other people and to wake people up, right? So that line between commercial and what you want to call resistance art or rebellious stuff, it's not a fucking line, it's a wall. I got something to say. You got to make art because it's in your heart, not because of how it's going to affect your bank account. My job as a radical political musician is not to lecture you. My argument is made in the mosh pit. Brothers and sisters, democracy has been hijacked! If you have a voice, you need to use your voice. The days of passively making art for art's sake, like those days, ended a long time ago. I've had a lot of experience doing the right thing and knowing that it was gonna really hurt my career. You're always gonna catch shit, and you, you have to just say, fuck it. It's still worth it, but it's hard sometimes. And we've been banned from certain countries because of what we say. I mean, we're still on a list of bands who were banned from the radio. We were caring deeply about our principles, our politics, so it was always our goal to communicate it to a bigger audience, even if our art is not comfortable for them. Art's a good story. A song is a good story, and those stories are what get to people. Um, and they got to me. That has been the role of art since human beings began creating art. 
They created songs, dances, theater in order to make sense of the universe. I need it to, to breathe. It's my outlet. It's my everything, you know? Art also can call into question things that are assumed as truths. As political activists or artists, we're supposed to question everything, like everything. And it's exhausting to question everything, but you should look at everything and why is it like that? And is that the best way for it to be? Why should a company own a million billboards and I own none, do, do you know? Our public spaces have become all about advertising and our media space is all about who has the biggest megaphone, which is usually determined by money or power. The, the problem with our side of the equation is, is all the money exists on the other side. They have the money, we don't. It's not there, you know, you have to do this because it's the right thing, not because, you know, it's everybody's gonna love you. There's that place that wants your money, there's that place that wants your money, here's a drive-through, they want your money, here's a vacation you could buy, here's a hotel you can stay in, here's a car wash, or here's a free alternative view a little lens you can look at as you're fucking out here. Take it or leave it, you know? It's free. In fact, it cost us a lot of money to put it there. And we did it for you. Every day, 365 days a year, seven days a week, wherever you go, you're gonna see visions. Whether they're positive or negative, you're gonna see them. Everybody wins uh, if art got a message and got something to say. So for me, it makes sense uh, to make things that can uh, open your eyes or talk about something that really matter. People can see something and then inhabit that space and have their own independent reaction to things. Art is so deeply affects people. Visuals affect people. It's really important to pull people in, then they can feel like they have power. Uh, when my mother used to take me to the shops with her when I was like six years old, uh, and there was a bit of graffiti, um, it's gone now, but it was a fight for peace. And it was that kind of thing that started making me think that there was a message out there that wasn't just an advertisement. And I think that's uh, when I started looking at graffiti. I was attracted to graffiti because of the Robin Hood aspect of it all. It feels good because it really feels like you're going against the oppressor. Graffiti in general is really pure art form. It's really democratic. Anybody can do it, you can do it anywhere. I realized that I could talk with the people to communicate with the society and share my awareness about uh, things that I don't like. I don't know, there's just some excitement to it that just, I still can't stop doing. Some of the guys in my band are like, what are you doing, fucking writing your name all over the place? Like, what's wrong with you? Like, you just don't get it. Yeah, it is almost like a drug, it's addicting. These guys are all criminals, I'm a criminal. It's like, what if we just did it during the day? You know, what if you got a, like an orange vest and you know, did it during the day? Then it would look like that's your job. Sometimes the police would just stop and watch you. The really important thing to get across to people who are new at this is to use humor. You know, if you go toe to toe with the cops, they're gonna bash you to the fucking ground. But if you can make the army guys or the cops laugh or, or see the humanity in what you're doing, that's subversive in the best way possible. I think raking the rules to uh, make a point. If you're making a fucking point, it's a good thing. We like using humor because it's fun. What are you doing? I'm actually just closing my account. Guys, guys, he's closing his account! It's a hook. It's like a, it's a way to get people interested and then to deliver the sort of medicine. 
If you get people laughing and their endorphins are up, again, you can slide a nice message in there. You can slide something really socially conscious in there. Either make it really, really pretty or make it really, really funny. And that's how you get past people's defenses. Political cartoons are usually humorous. It has a social critique, but disguised as an innocent comic strip. So we think cartoons could be extremely effective. Humor it creates a kind of dynamic where people can come in that may not agree with you. And it creates a space where they may listen to your point of view, where if you just shout them down, they're just gonna freeze up. <laughs> That's very funny, I wish I understand it. You know, if you talk to a lot of people who are involved in movements to overthrow authoritarian regimes, they often say that humor was what kept the movement going. You saw Charlie Chaplin making fun of Hitler, and that went around the world, and that's studied in, you know, film classes now. And it is funny, and it's talking about one of the most dangerous political figures in all of history. You know, dictators do not like to be made fun of. Fascists absolutely do not like to be made fun of. Donald Trump does not like to be made fun of. You know, our president is a narcissist. He has a golf course where he would like to be buried. We decided that him being the only tombstone would be kind of boring, so we gave him some friends to remind him of some of the things that he buried. We snuck under the golf course in the middle of the night, built the cemetery, you know, lodged the tombstones deep into the earth so you couldn't get them out, and then just got the fuck out. My favorite tombstone, the Here Lies Decency. He moved on her like a bitch because there's nothing so clever that we can think of that like supersedes what comes out of his own mouth sometimes. During the Obama years, I'd say that protest art was not flourishing, but desperate times motivate people in decline, especially in the last few years, lined up with the right message right ahead of the right moment. The Walk of Fame piece, which was made about a terrible sequence of events and putting the names of people who lost their lives to police brutality on the Walk of Fame, is so moving. It's more moving now than when it was made. We have cops that are murdering people. You broke the contract! when you killed us in the streets and didn't give a fuck. Oh my fucking God. I think that art runs parallel with the pent up anger, the unresolved calls for justice. Everybody knows that they wouldn't like to be a black man in this country. It's never lost its power. It's getting more and more powerful because it keeps fucking happening. Over years, as much as I would say in the context of the police abuse, much as things have changed, some things stay the same. Racism and the police murders of black people is absolutely as American as baseball or apple pie. You know what else is an ingrained tentpole of American society is resistance to injustice. That's been there from day one. I have a dream today. And when you're willing to pay the price for freedom, then you get it. I'm 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 Mr. Cabernet, taking the knee. That was a powerful, powerful statement. It has informed, enlightened, and educated young people. Our job as creatives is to illustrate the truth that those those people are are standing up for. So I painted him in a Falcons uniform. Later on I did Muhammad Ali as T'Challa to go with Kaepernick because they're sort of like on the same parallel in terms of like they're speaking their heart. America's never been great for people of color. And you know that's something that needs to be addressed. Let's make America great for the first time. 
And anytime you have that, and it goes against the status quo, then you come public enemy number one. Here in Atlanta, an artist created a mural in 2017, but this week it was torn down, and the artist thinks it's no coincidence it happened just before the big game. Literally a bulldozer bulldozing over the building that the murals was on. This is the first day of Black History Month. It wouldn't be that bold to destroy a mural of Kaepernick Super Bowl weekend in the blackest city in America. But that's what happened. A bus that was transporting the players drove down that street. So it was like, y'all went and bulldozed the building because Colin Kaepernick's on the building? I mean. So Ash came up with the idea for Capra Bowl. She was like, let's paint Kaepernick all over the city. You attack us, you want a response. I reached out to the streets. When there's a need, we come together. This is like the biggest military industrial complex and they're scared of a painting. What they're scared of is a revolution. They're scared of us coming together and just shutting shit down and being like, you know what? We're fucking done with you. We will definitely not uh, shut up and dribble. Artists and athletes and others who use their, their very public platform to speak out against injustice. Often, yes, they do become ostracized, but the righteousness of their acts proves to be heroic. Kaepernick lost a job because he was like highlighting police brutality. It's our job to back him up. And we still going through the shit like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. And that's the spark that lit the prairie fire. I think there's been a deafening silence in recent years leading up to this sudden explosion onto the streets. Once police brutality goes and kills George Floyd, it wasn't much for all of us to come together and actually make a push. What we've been seeing lately is both an awakening and a reckoning with regards to the issue of race in America. I am your president of law and order and an ally of all peaceful protesters. Donald Trump has brought a lot of this into the open. I don't see him as a threat. I see him as a call to arms. Ladies and gentlemen, leaders and fighters for freedom and liberty and the American dream, the best is yet to come. Divide and conquer is how Trump and his cronies and Bush and his cronies and Reagan and his cronies and Hitler and his cronies, that's how they control people, divide and conquer. So unite and never give up. You have a system that's murdering people because of their color or the difference of their culture. You have a system that's colonizing the world and you're worried about a statue? If the statue represents some old way of thinking, bring it down. Uproot all this shit. And that's okay not to have in the middle of your city a statue of people who killed your ancestors. When you see injustice, fight it. These older motherfuckers have stolen your future. And so the only option is to rebel. I think we've got to see that a riot is the language of the unheard. And what is it that America has failed to hear?
Historically, we've divided a lot of the movements. You know, we divide the feminist movement from the climate movement. We separate black liberation from the free love movement. And those are all inextricably tied together. That only happens when we bring everyone to the table. We need to be loud, be seen, and we need allies. For those of you who are on the front lines taking abuse, you have great company throughout history. People exactly like yourselves have stood up in times of great injustice, and the only possible way to make a more humane, a more decent planet is for you to do what you're doing. This is public space. And I think this generation suddenly is reclaiming the street. You're seeing more of that punk rock, do-it-yourself aesthetic that drives new movements, not preserves old movements. There's no drug more potent than the spirit of rebellion. If you're able to implement joy, you're arming yourself with a psychological attribute that your oppressor doesn't have. Take up space, take up as much space as possible, be as loud as possible and make things with your hands, make actual objects, take up actual physical space and get out there and make something. So living a life where you do what you want and you encourage other people to live together and to create their own fucking reality, that's the shit. And that pisses off the powerful more than anything else. The bigger the battle you're going through, the greater the reward for coming out the other side. The movement for black lives is being regarded as one of the most powerful movements in the history of human beings. And what that means is it allows us to imagine a world in which racism no longer exists. What does equity look like? What could it look like if we didn't have prisons or if we didn't have police? You know, the role of the artist is to be a mirror for society. To do that, we actually have to be willing to dig in deep and say the things that are really hard to say. The power of artists is that we can create the images, the songs, the films, the depictions of what the future can look like and help people feel it. There's no us versus them. There's just us. Everybody in the world is us. Fucking get that straight in your head and we'll be all right. I hope it was recorded. It definitely was. <laughs> Perfect time. <laughs> I can smell it. <laughs> the, the main thing again is just kind of watch your back and, and make sure that you get a fast car and a passport, worst case. Um, never trust a guy that won't have a beer with you because that guy's probably lying to you and he's scared of loose lips that he's gonna tell you the truth. It looked like public space to me. I didn't know it was private property, but okay, okay. Here's a police helicopter. <laughs> My parents are dead and I grew up in an apartment and I've been through a lot of things, you know. I got bad grades and once someone punched me, being political really helps. <laughs> Fuck a man who don't like a dog. Like dogs, they can smell evil. And if a guy doesn't like a dog, so like Trump will not have a beer with you and he don't like a dog. So like, that's all I'm gonna say about him.